so uh, now for something completely different. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about DMAS, uh, the Invisible Design Revolution, or to put it another way, how fabric can help save the world. How many of you know what this is? No one? Okay, this is a two liter soda bottle before it's been blow molded. It's called a preform. It's made out of a material called polyethylene terephthalate, or PET. It's an extraordinary material. It has certain characteristics. Um, it's also the same material that's used for, di for nylon and dacron threads and for making fabrics. The reason it's used for both of those things is that it has enormous tensile strength. It's one of a family of plastics called orientable plastics because under certain conditions, the scientists can figure out how to help the molecules arrange themselves into patterns or screens or weaves that have certain behavioral characteristics like tensile strength. I learned about tensile strength uh, in 1980 when I was doing a project for the largest manufacturer of these bottles. While my colleagues and I were in the factory figuring out how to reduce energy and, use, and, and resource costs and use in the factory, the product engineers for the company did something really extraordinary. They figured out how to cut 30% out of the mass of the bottle and still make the bottle stronger, last longer, more durable at the same time. I want to repeat this. These product engineers eliminated 30% of their product and made it better at the same time. I want you to remember that because I didn't know it at the time, but my whole career was sitting on that bottle. Because um, in doing that they, that, they were the harbinger of an entirely new design revolution. A revolution, an invisible revolution that was going to change the world and certainly changed my career. So, for the last 40 years, I've been obsessed with a problem. I wanted to identify pathways that businesses and, ho and whole economies could thrive and survive at a time when resources were in, would be increasingly constrained because of the demands from a growing population who want to participate in the global economy. And on the other hand, by uh, an environment that would be increasingly strained. How could we do that? I got interested in the problem from my mentor, Buckminster Fuller, who used to say that nature wasn't designed for humans to have to choose between a healthy environment and a healthy economy. The key, I realized early on, had to do with the way that we use resources to make things. But over time, I realized that it wasn't as simple as doing energy conservation and, and the kinds of standard things that we do now. It was going to take a radical change, a radical leap in our abilities to do more with less. It would take, uh, we would have to learn to disconnect the production of wealth from the production of stuff. We would have to move from an economy of mass production to an economy of resource mass reduction and it would affect how every company makes its products, how people use products, how they interact with them. So, my colleagues and I uh, spent some time, over the last five years, my colleagues and I spent some time researching to find out if we could understand how humanity's capability to make such a leap had progressed. We began inventorying new companies that were starting, spinning out of university research laboratories around the way, around the world, new science and new technology. And what we found was breathtaking. Nothing short of breathtaking. We found vast amounts, of, we found dozens of new technologies that, dr that could dramatically increase our ability to produce wealth with less and less materials, less and less mass, less and less fuels. So I want to share a little bit of what I learned in this experiment, in this process with you. 
And we have to start with a simple model. This is the global economy. Now, the global economy exists for one purpose, to deliver things of value to people. People buy products from companies because they want things that produce benefits for them. They want things that will make their life better. They want wealth. They want freedom from hunger and pain and thirst. They want, the, uh, they want freedom to explore new opportunities to further improve their lives. Now, in order to get those things, they pay. You pay for things. And you, when you do, you are paying to have resources dug out of the earth, processed, shipped around the world, made into finished products, shipped around the world again so that you can use them. As customers, we're constantly paying for those things. And we can see that all of the things that we make, all of the things that we use, this microphone, the seats in this room, the building itself, are all environment rearranged. They're all the Earth's crust rearranged. So here is the problem. The population of the world is growing. And everyone in that population wants access to the fruits of the modern global economy. But there's no possible way to do it the way we do it now. When we stimulate the economy and make things grow, a whole host of, of problems occur. We have uh, rising fuel prices, rising commodity prices, we have inflation, we have uh, international tensions, even war, and a whole host of other problems that debt all grow from that problem, from the, use, from the increasing use of resources. Now, on the other hand, when the economy slows down, a whole host of new problems occur. Environmental problems may decline, but then we have recession, unemployment, social unrest, and again, possibly war. So what do we do? It turns out that many countries and many big companies are very aware of this problem and are taking dramatic steps to try and change the, and protect their, their supply chains, their supply of resources for the future. Many companies are even beginning to completely redesign their products based on this. In processing all of these resources now, something is lost. In all of this shipping materials around the world to make these processes, something is always lost. We call that waste and pollution. But waste and pollution are nothing more than valuable resources that we all paid to have dug up out of the ground, processed, shipped around the world, and, and, and made into products and shipped around the world again. Remember, because everything that comes out of the back went in the front. <laughs> so let's look at this a little more closely. This simple model shows us our predicament. Now, uh, so the question is, are we, if, if this simple statements are true, that when we do things to speed up the economy, we cause one set of problems that seem devastating, but slowing down the economy causes another set of problems to seem devastating, then we seem to be facing an evolutionary cul-de-sac. There doesn't seem to be any way out. We can't go forward, we can't go backward. Are we stuck? Well, to be able to answer that question, I want to share a couple of more things with you. The first one is that I told you at the beginning that that arrow up in the right-hand corner that leads to people was the delivery of things that have value. You probably assumed that I meant products, but I didn't. I meant it, that arrow represents value that products deliver, benefits that products deliver, benefits that create wealth. and. The, there are things that can improve our life. And if you think of it this way, material products are really the means to an end, but not the end. They're the messenger, not the message. They're the delivery mechanism for benefits that actually make wealth. But they are not the wealth itself. Lawn mowers deliver attractive lawns. Washing machines deliver clean clothes. Light bulbs deliver light. Attractive curtains deliver uh, darkness and privacy. And batteries deliver portable kilowatt hours. And understanding this idea is set essential for understanding this way out, the pathway out of this cul-de-sac that we seem to be facing. 
Now, the challenge is to find new and better ways to, to derive those benefits with less and less resources. And I want to show you a couple of examples of some of the kinds of new technologies that we discovered when we started doing our inventory. Technologies that produce more value, more benefits for people with dramatically less mass. I told you these were technologies spinning out of research laboratories all around the world. A few years ago, I had a conversation with the chief executive of a major battery corporation and he asked me to talk to him about how they could measure their environmental performance. And I told him he couldn't do it as long as he thought he was head of, was head of a battery company. I told him that he was in a portable energy company and that nobody really wanted his batteries. I said, what they want is portable energy and you have to figure out how to deliver it in other ways or somebody else will. He said, what do you mean? I said, people are gonna get uh, energy, that appliances are getting so efficient, people are gonna get the energy from their skin or they're gonna get it from the movement of their clothing, or they're gonna get it from, the, from, from walking, or from the sun. Well, lo and behold, this little device, invented in Shanghai, China, uh, it's in a demonstration mode still, but nevertheless, that device is an MP3 player that looks like a Band-Aid, and it gets the energy that it needs from the owner's skin. Here uh, is a fabric developed in England that actually can be woven into clothing and that converts both sunlight and movement, electrostatic movement, into useful energy. This is a battery that uh, it developed in Switzerland. They call, it's, they call it a paper-like battery because it's a material that's thinner than paper. It's a rechargeable battery that can be used to make the cases of the appliance and actually store the energy in it. It can be put into clothing, woven into clothing. Uh, or used in the doors of cars to make hybrid cars without heavy batteries. Now there are many more of these uh, kinds of technologies. This is a, uh, a fabric that was developed by scientists who were studying the unique characteristics of shark skin and its ability to resist bacteria. So the know-how for this is being made into, is being experimented with by science into making kitchen counters and food preparation services and hospital services that prevent harmful bacteria from communicating with each other and therefore causing harm. This kind of technology can eliminate an entire, um, uh, um, an entire industry of toxic chemicals used for disinfectants. Here we have a, a material that um, is called super hydrophobic fabrics. Uh, super hydrophobic uh, fabrics, hydrophobic meaning water phobic, uh, are uh, being attached to other kinds of cloths and materials that keep them from getting wet. It's based on the way that uh, water lilies and, and um, lotus plants clean themselves. This material um, could eliminate the need for dryers because it's not just water resistant, it actually keeps water from touching the surface. And other engineers and other universities are now working on trying to manipulate the surface of metals because if they can do it, they can completely eliminate the toxic industry of de-icing airplanes because the water won't actually ever touch the surface of the plane and therefore can't freeze. Here is a technology developed in Switzerland made out of fabric. It's fabric made into structural beams that can hold up buildings stronger than steel, one fourth of the weight of those beams. Uh, another one, an extraordinary one, is a bicycle. This bicycle weighs 65% less than a standard bicycle, but that's not what's incredible about it. What's incredible about it is that it was manufactured with a process that cut 10 times of the materials out of the whole life cycle of the bicycle. And it was done by a technology that's very much like printing. It's called 3D printing. It was printed or additive layer manufacturing using CAD drawings that go down to the molecular level. They were able to create a bicycle by basically layering one level of molecules at a time, making the entire bicycle in one piece, including the moving parts. 
and there was virtually no waste in the manufacturing process. Here we have another extraordinary example of a fabric-like material, a wallpaper, that when you apply three volts to the wallpaper, it produces, it emits light from minuscule organic light emitting diodes built into the wallpaper. Other companies are working on paint versions of the same thing. A product like this can eliminate the entire, in, the entire lighting infrastructure of buildings, not only light bulbs, but fixtures and ballasts and wires and other kinds of, uh, of equipment that it takes to do it. These represent the kind of dramatic technologies that are flourishing, bubbling up out of research labs all around the world that have the potential to drastically change the ratio of wealth to stuff in our, in our economy. I just want to talk about fabrics for a minute. We all know that, the, that fabrics have benefits just like all other uh, products. And we know we buy fa fabrics because they're beautiful, because they keep us warm. We always have because they make soft sheets or they, ha they have visual beauty. But there are other benefits that we've become used to for fabrics like thermal insulation, resisting water, resisting wrinkles and dirt. When they first started making wrinkle-free clothing, they were spraying all kinds of chemicals on the cotton, for example, to keep it from being wrinkled. But now scientists have learned that if they can just manipulate the shape of the weave and the tightness of the yarn, they can achieve the same effect without any additives. And that's what we have now when you buy wrinkle, most wrinkle-free clothing. So now we have many, many other functions of fabric. And it turns out that there's some interesting things about fabric. It's a DMAS strategy. It's a resource performance strategy. And it's true that fabrics are getting lighter and thinner just like other advancing technologies. But there's something much more extraordinary about fabric. It's really more akin to the functions of a cell phone. Remember five years ago when you bought a cell phone, that cell phone could make a phone call. We thought it was a miracle. But now your cell phone runs your life. Your cell phone keeps track of, track of your calendar, your entertainment, your research, uh, all of your communications, your entertainment. And fabric is like that because the number of functions being developed for fabrics around the world is so extraordinary um, that it's hard to imagine. We know that fabrics resist bullets. Did you know that fabrics are being generated yarns, fabric yarns called, called sometimes called bucky tubes, um, are being uh, explored the ability to uh, allow molecules to arrange themselves into tubes where a strand the thickness of a human hair could hold up a bridge instead of the thick wires that presently hold up bridges. So fabrics have many, many applications, and this is just beginning. And the fabric, and the, fabric uh, the, the revolutionary new fabrics that are emerging from incorporating many of these new nanotechnologies and biotechnologies into fabrics are absolutely astonishing. So I want to end with a thought. From now on, innovation has direction. In a crowded and resource-constrained world, innovation is no longer a random phenomenon. Innovation has to have direction. Innovation has to always be now about doing much more with less. Fabrics touch every aspect of our lives. Innovation in fabrics are improving resource performance in almost every field of engineering and science. And they're playing an active role in what I call the design revolution. Thank you. <laughs>